Hello, everybody, and welcome to a spoiler podcast discussion for a television show that has been over for almost half of a year now. Um, I'm Connor Nielsen, uh, but uh, this is not my channel. I'm just a guest. This uh, is the channel of the Comics Kid 2099, uh, and here he is now. How are you doing, Comics Kid? I am doing very well, Connor. How are you? You know, um, I'm awake. And I don't know how much longer I'm going to be like speaking in a way that's like coherent. So, um, you know, but you don't have right to now, be coherent. You just have to be awake. So you're you're doing everything you're supposed to do. I'm just going to apologize in advance, everybody. Um, yep. So we are talking about the Marvel Disney Plus show Hawkeye. I guess it was a mini series because of like Emmy eligibility and whatnot. It was put up as a limited series. So this is all there is for this show, but it was a six episode television uh, streaming thing uh, revolving around the Avengers character Hawkeye played by Jeremy Renner. Now, um, uh, comics kid, why don't you explain the plot of Hawkeye? Okay. Um, so uh, Hawkeye is back with his family after the events of uh, Avengers Endgame, and uh, he is spending some time with his kids uh, watching a musical, and then uh, he sees on the news that somebody has got out the old uh, Ronin uniform that he was using to kill bad guys in between, uh, in the time jump in between Avengers Infinity War and Avengers Endgame, and he needs to put the kibosh on that because that could uh, lead back to him uh, because nobody knows that he was Ronan. Uh, that was kind of a, uh, a trade secret among a few people, I guess. And um, the person in the costume is Kate Bishop, who uh, she has uh, snuck into this black auction, uh, black market auction uh, that has uh, the Ronan costume as well as a Rolex watch. Um, and then this group of gangsters called the Tracksuit Mafia, they break into the auction to steal the watch. And then Kate puts on the costume to fight some bad guys. And that's what leads to her crossing paths with Clint. And then the rest of the series is them kind of uh, investigating this. Clint mostly just wants to get the suit back uh, and the watch. And then uh, Kate uh, believes that her uh, mother's fiance is a villain uh, because her mother's fiance's uncle, <clears throat> sorry, uh, turned up dead, uh, murdered by a sword, and her mother's fiance is really good with a sword. So Kate is kind of investigating that, uh, and lots of stuff happens along the way. Um, that's our as, as close to a spoiler-free review as or spoiler-free synopsis as we can do at the moment. But um, Connor, I don't think I ever picked your brain on the, or maybe you told me a little bit about what you thought about it because you were watching it. As, as it was coming out, uh, I didn't watch it at all until we were getting ready for this podcast. So what did you think of Hawkeye? Yeah, um, this was uh, a Christmas. This is Christmas themed. Um, so this was coming out actually around Christmas time. Um, and of course, the big lingering question is, will Hawkeye get back home in time for Christmas? That's kind of the big uh, thing. Um, I think, you know, there were five uh, Marvel Studios shows that uh, premiered on Disney Plus in the year of 2021. Uh, there was uh, Loki, The Falcon and the Winter Soldier, WandaVision, What If, and Hawkeye. And I think Hawkeye is far and away the best one of that lineup. And um, I think it kind of comes down to Hawkeye is the kind of character you should be centering a show around where he's been around. He's like, if we're going to have a character that was in the movies, like established characters that are getting their own movies and all five of those shows that were in 2021, all of them were bringing back characters uh, from the movies, right? They were giving mm -hmm. them their own little spinoff shows. And, um, and then what if is just, you know, bringing back a lot of those characters because that's a little different, but it's kind of the same thing. But I think Hawkeye makes more sense to build a show spinoff thing around for Disney Plus more than uh, Falcon and Winter Soldier, more than Loki, um, because, uh, you know, where we left him off, it felt like we kind of there was still more left there. He was always a supporting player, always uh, the the bridesmaid, so to speak. Um, but throughout the movies, there were enough things there, little breadcrumbs to kind of give him enough there to build off of but also there's enough not there so you can build your own show so um the the show has issues um i have 
a whole lot of notes. Um, but I think for the most part, this is highly enjoyable. And a lot of it comes down to Haley Steinfeld is a star. Uh, she's not, she's never been in a whole lot of movies or shows, but whenever she does, like she's always like a, a bright spot and she knows how to pick roles. But I also think just beyond her, the casting in general is pretty dang good. Um, and while I do think Jeremy Renner at first is a little hard to pin, pin down, once it settles into the Kate Bishop, uh, Clint Barton team up show, this is the most like enjoyable, like just conventional Marvel entertainment that I've seen in some time, especially in 2021, which was a rough year for Marvel in my book. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, anyways, we can get into more of it. Uh, how about you, Comics Kid? How did you feel about Hawkeye? I think you and I are pretty much on the same page. You may have different issues than I did, but I think my exact thoughts that I was thinking of earlier today was this is head, shoulders, torso, and knees above <laughs> everything else that Disney has done with Marvel on Disney+. Plus. Um, I, uh, I really like this show. It does have some problems, um, mostly for me in the final episode, uh, but I, yes. um, I think that it's good. Uh, there's some things we can discuss. Um, I liked it, uh, and I am even, uh, I would even go so far as to say, like, with the other shows, I know we've already talked about them, but I think you could have done a good show about Loki. Um, I, I will even say, I think you could have done a good show about Falcon and Winter Soldier. I just think that they mishandled just about everything with those shows. Um, uh, with what's interesting is like with Loki, he was a, like, he wasn't the main character, but he was a huge character in those Thor movies. And so it didn't seem like too much of a stretch to just spin him off and say, okay, now he is the main character because he has already gotten a lot of screen time. A lot of people like him. Um, and so all you have to do is find a, a premise to center around this character who has already been uh, featured pretty heavily in these movies. Uh, and then with Falcon and Winter Soldier, both of them were featured pretty prominently in the Captain America movies. And so like you have characters that, uh, have developed a fan following uh, over the course of these movies, and then you just have to gently break them off of the parent franchise that they're spinning out of and then give them their own franchise. Um, it's like, you know, doing a spinoff can be tricky. Like, you know, back in the 70s, you had Three's Company, and then the landlords got their own show. And I never watched The Ropers, so I don't know what the premise was, but I think it only lasted two seasons, and Three's Company lasted like six or seven. And so, like, doing a spinoff can be tricky. Um, and with Hawkeye, the thing is, he is the one who had the least, uh, I won't say the least screen time, but before this show, we really didn't know a lot about him. Um, like in the first Avengers movie, we didn't know anything about him other than he had a work history with Natasha. And then you find out he has a family in Age of Ultron. But even then, he was always kind of, like you said, he was always the bridesmaid. And so on the one hand, it makes sense to say like, well, there's fertile ground. We can do whatever we want with him because we have barely done anything with him so far. But on the other hand, you run the risk of people being like, I don't really care about Hawkeye. Like you haven't given me a reason to care about him up until now. Uh, but I think they handled it very well. Um, like I said, I think this is the best. Uh, I didn't watch uh, What If. I only watched one episode, but I think this is much better than those other live action shows. And I haven't watched Moon Knight either, um, but uh, I, I liked it. Um, so, Connor, where should we begin? Um, yeah, that, I mean, that's a good question. Um, I guess uh, I did want to respond to something you were saying. Like, you are right. Like, they could have made a good show out of Loki or Falcon and the Winter Soldier and all that. I What I was saying was that, to me, it makes this makes the most sense because all of these are picking up after the events of Endgame. Mm -hmm. And with those other characters... Um, it felt like there was some kind of emotional payoff. Um, it was like when I hear that there is a show about the Winter Soldier, it's we're just kind of treading familiar ground, right? Mm -hmm. And that show just kind of gets you back to where those characters, I guess, were at the end of Endgame. You know? Yeah. Like the, their lives don't really look a whole lot different. And then um, on the on top of like Loki, though, it's like as an audience member, I've been through the ebbs and flows with Loki and then he died. And then we're just sort of spinning off him from Avengers. And then they're like, well, 
we kind of want to have the Loki that lived, you know, the, mm-hmm. the, that made it all the way through the movie. So let's devote an entire first episode to just literally explaining those other movies to Avengers era Loki, you know? Yeah. Um, and so if you have to pick, like, I think if you were to make a Loki show, there's plenty of fertile ground to set it between Thor the Dark World and Thor Ragnarok when he's like king of Asgard. Mm-hmm. There you go. There's your Loki show. <laughs> like, it, that seems so obvious to me, but I guess they wanted to... Um, uh, everything post Endgame was post Endgame, right? Except for Black Widow because of contracts. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I guess as far as a place to start, um, I just wanted to say because I'm sure we'll get kind of like you know getting into specifics. I just want to say broadly speaking, I really like the setting. I know that this is based largely on the one run on Hawkeye that anybody knows anything about, which is the Matt Fraction run that featured mostly art from David Aja, but also had like Francesco Francavilla and, um, you know, other, other great artists. Um, but I don't think that that run was set during Christmas. And I don't think, you know, this is like a Christmas classic, but I think the Christmas setting, it adds a nice tender, um, ticking clock that even though like if you miss Christmas, you can still get to the day after Christmas, but there is still that like, you know, that cultural thing where getting home for Christmas is a very easy thing to get behind. Um, And on top of that, though, um, you know, the idea of being in New York during Christmas time is sort of just like this American concept that's just in media. And it's just kind of nice that, you know, they didn't need to set this during Christmas, but they did. And they, they made enough use of it. Like, I enjoyed the Christmas music coming in every once in a while and put up a meme. It's about family. (laughs) <laughs> you know, you know, we, we nothing says family quite like Christmas. And if Fast and Furious is not going to make a Christmas movie, um, I don't know. This 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 felt more Christmassy to me than something like Iron Man three. Um, and I think Iron Man three is a much better story than this is. But still, I don't know. I liked the setting quite a bit. It was welcome. Yeah, um, I I like, and, and I think I told I probably said this uh, fifteen thousand times on this channel, but I. After Endgame, what I really wanted was some, like, phase one level stakes of, like, the entire universe or the multiverse or all of space and time does not have to be in danger. Um, You can kind of go back to, like, smaller stuff. And this is that. Um, I felt so much more invested in, is Clint going to make it home for Christmas? Like, I really want him. uh, He made a promise to his kids. I really just want to see him go home and hug his kids and hug his wife. Um, I don't care uh, if... Sylvie kills Kang the Conqueror and the multiverse falls apart. I don't care (laughs) about that, but I care that this guy is possibly going to let his kids down because he has to choose between family. It's about family. uh, (laughs) Has to choose between that and his duty. And I like uh, it's smaller and I can grasp onto that. I can latch onto it because that is something that I can relate to. You know, we, we've all had to work a a, a shift when we'd rather be home with our family, you know? Um, And so Mm -hmm. like, that um, I, I liked that, um, and uh, this isn't obviously when you have a guy who shoots arrows, you're not going to be able to have the entire universe uh, be at stake, or it's going to be very difficult. Uh, and so I kind of like that this is down to like street level crime, um, and we had that too with Falcon and Winter Soldier, but I, you know, I like this better. Um, so yeah, uh, I and the Christmas thing, it really didn't click with me until like after the show was done, but like. This is kind of ticking off like some various like um, I'm sh- like isn't Jingle all the way kind of a like ticking time bomb like he has to get the action figure for his kid. That's right, um, yeah. And yeah. and so this kind of feels like it's doing like Jingle all the way meets Die Hard, uh, because like you know the, the whole last episode like about half of the action in that takes place inside a big building, and I've never seen Die Hard, but my understanding is he's trapped in a building with some terrorists, and so like this kind of feels like it's just trying to like remind you of all the other Christmassy classics. Uh, I'm I'm not sure if we can call Jingle All the Way a classic, but um, it, it <laughs> hey, kind of it's feel- a classic for some people. Yeah, yeah. Looking at um, you, DJ. I don't know if you're listening to this, but <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, I uh, it, it kind of. <laughs> It feels like it's hitting those, it's homaging those things and doing it well, I think. Yeah, and, and I, I think you had hit on a, an interesting point, uh, just kind of regarding the setting, um, which is that, you know, we've all, like, when you, I like the way you say that, like, we all were working a shift when we'd rather be at home with the family. 
And I think, you know, Jeremy Renner has always kind of, I think Mike Staclasa from Red Letter Media once referred to Jeremy Renner as like the working man's movie star, where he just sort of feels like a dude that mm-hmm. just like, you know, when he's done acting, he just like goes to the bar to get a beer or something. And he kind of does have that every guy charm. And he always has. And I I, I like Jeremy Renner. I, I, I think it's, he's an actor that has always, I feel like Hollywood studios have always struggled trying to place him. Uh, because they want to turn him into like a movie star. Like they gave him a Bourne movie. Um, the fourth Mission Impossible movie was trying to like peg him as the replacement for Tom Cruise. Um, and this was all happening because he was the star of a Best Picture winner called The Hurt Locker. And then two years later, he was nominated for Best Supporting Actor in the Ben Affleck movie, The Town. So he was really blowing up kind of the end of the 2000s, beginning of the 2010s. And so it only made sense that he would probably be in The Avengers, right? Um and just as an actor, though, he has a much more rugged, lower key charm than someone like Tom Cruise. And so just kind of this show placing him as, you know, he, you know, you have Kate uh, Bishop, who was like, we got to we got to market you. We got to find a way to make you big and sizzle. And he's like, yeah, but like my job was to be a spy. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like being a superhero, I think more than any other character in the Avengers, like this was his job. He has he's not like. Natasha, who doesn't really have a family to go back to, he does. This is like his job. And whereas, you know, the uh, the Avengers became Natasha's family, they never really were for Hawkeye. And so there's plenty of fertile ground to build a show around. And I think the show is able to build a lot out of that. And, um, uh, and, and you know, having the ways in which uh, Hawkeye and Kate kind of are opposites of one another. I really like that because Kate is really rich and kind of showy. And, you know, I, I think in the world of the Avengers, Hawkeye, you know, he's not worried about his mortgage payment or anything, but he's much more blue collar compared to someone like Kate Bishop. Um, but, and I liked seeing them finding common ground and, and that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah. Um, that's a good point that he's kind of a, uh, a polar opposite to Kate. I didn't really pick up on that. Um, I, I wrote down in my notes, so I think I told you this once off camera maybe, but um, I have always kind of disliked Haley Steinfeld, and it is 100% not her fault, um, and I'll go ahead and come clean with why. Uh, she was in a movie called The Edge of Seventeen, and I didn't watch the movie, but I saw the trailer, and like everything in that trailer was her being like, Ugh, my parents don't understand me, Ugh, my hair is so ugly, Ugh, Like my friend is having sex with my brother, Ugh, life is so unfair, and I was just like, I don't, I don't care. I don't like, I, I, I don't want to watch anything with you because of that. Like first impressions are very important. And that was the first time I ever saw her was in that trailer. And I was just like, no, no, no thanks for you. Uh, I'm just, you know, I'm mentally, I'm blocking you out of existence. And then I saw that she was going to be Kate Bishop. And I was like, ah, and, um, incidentally, I wasn't really, I didn't think I was uh, going to be watching this. And then you had said, hey, do you want to do a podcast? And I was like, yeah, let's let's do this Hawkeye thing. I'll, I'll, and I really liked her. Um, I was surprised because I kind of had this preconceived idea that she's like, I, I don't know. I, I, I should be able to separate a character she played from the actress. But when I just saw that trailer for that movie, I was just like, this is like making my stomach churn. And but she's really good here. Um, she's really funny. Um, and. The humor is not too forced. Um, like she, at times, uh, she is saying something that in the hands of anyone else could be annoying. And if she pushed it just a little further, it could be annoying. But I think it works. Uh, maybe other people out there kind of disagree. Um, but I, and it's not always her. That is, the humor is not always coming from her, but some of the situations she's in. Like um, there's one part I I thought was pretty funny where they shoot a zip line from one building to another and she gets her bow over it to try and slide down. And then she gets stuck halfway. And, and that's more of like a, like that, that could be in a Deadpool movie, right? Where it's like, ha, look at us. We're being self-aware. Like you see this kind of thing all the time. And then the zip line just works flawlessly, but here she tries it and it doesn't work just right. And I was like, okay, yeah, um, that that's funny. And it's not necessarily the humor coming from her, but she's in a humorous situation. But uh, I think, yeah, but specifically, like, I think you just tapped, I'm sorry to interrupt, but that's no, like a ahead. perfect, perfect way of observing the tone of this show. Because I think I got some issues with the production here, but like, I think the where this show really like makes me like watching it is just the tone it strikes. Because you're right, like what you just said could have been in a Deadpool movie. 
the tone of a Deadpool movie is, hey, wouldn't it be funny if a superhero didn't do it, <laughs> right? They get stuck on the zip line. Uh, they, they look really stupid if that happened to me, right? But this tone is much, it's, it's so much less irreverent. It's And it's more like relatable, like, like job sort of thing. Like, oh my God, just my luck. Here mm-hmm. I am trying to be a partner and I get stuck. What's up with that? You know what I mean? It feels like the 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 tone is different. And it's like, I want to get over there to help Hawkeye because, you know, this secret agent who I don't know is a secret agent is beating up my partner and he's like my hero and I got to go help him and show him that I can do it. Oh no, I got caught on the zip line. You know, it's a thing you don't think would happen, but it happened. Mm-hmm. And it also was making me look like a bad partner and I'm still trying to win his, win him over. You know what I mean? Like there's, there's more going on than just pointing and laughing at something. Um, yeah. So yeah, I don't know. I think you really tapped onto, tapped onto something there. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, congratulations for the series. If anything, you won me over on Haley Steinfeld. Um, I didn't think I would ever like her just because of that trailer. If I had never seen that trailer, who knows where I'd be today? I might be That's just kind of funny to me because a age of 17 is a great movie. <laughs> um, but like, it's it's like, so you, so you never saw like the true grit remake or anything. I eventually I did. And I think I, uh, cause that was before edge of 17, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Edge of 17 was 2016 or 17. And, uh, that was 2010. She was 14 in um, True Grit. Yeah. And she was nominated for an Oscar. And I think that remake is not good. Um, mm. I, oof. hey, everybody. <laughs> uh, I know I know you love the Coen brothers. You know, they're good at making movies and all. Uh, here's the thing, though. The original True Grit is amazing. And every scene of the remake, I'm just thinking this scene was like 50% better and the, the original <laughs> um but but she's but I, I really like even even in the remake i like the character of maddie ross and she's a really good maddie ross she's also a lot more age appropriate because i think in the remake it's like you have a six foot tall woman who has like a little girl haircut and she's like i'm i'm a little girl <laughs> i'm like no, no you're not uh, mm. even even in the, re- in the even in the original maddie ross is still awesome it's, it's okay that she's like 30 and she has to play like a 17 year old but whatever um, yeah, yeah, I, I don't think I've seen all the original, uh, True Grit, so I, uh, I have no comment on that, but, um, but yeah, I did eventually watch True Grit, and I think maybe it was a little ways into it, I was like, oh, it's that actress I don't like, and again, like, I was being totally unfair, I want to, I want to admit to that, um, and I like to think that I have gone through some character growth now that I've watched this, and I really enjoyed her here, um, I also really liked that, uh, Hawkeye, doesn't feel a comfortable being in a spotlight and b like like every time like in this movie when he's at the urinal and some guy goes up to him and says can you give me an autograph and he's like you can just see the disdain on hawkeye's face and like part of that may just be me and my general like disdain with interacting with humanity um (laughs) like i i don't i don't consider myself better than everyone else but i do really really hate like being out in public and like talking to people like I I'm just you know that's kind of how I am and so I was like hey I can see a little bit of myself in this guy like that may be the first time I've ever seen a little bit of myself in a superhero um but he's also he really does not consider himself an appropriate role model uh that and like as soon as he meets Kate she's like can you autograph my bow like she loves him and he's just like uh I don't know about this and I I love that um I really love the journey that he kind of has to go on um, here. And like, there's one part where he really like tries to terminate the partnership between himself and Kate. And it feels believable because of the way that it happened. Um, I I like that. Um, And so uh, I really enjoyed uh, his emotional journey in this, I I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would agree. Um, I think I like where we meet him. So I, I guess I should say I, I, this is my second time watching through it. I was watching it as it was coming out and I was a little slow to be won over by the show. Um, and a lot of the stuff that I was kind of resistant towards in the first couple of episodes, I just I just didn't have watching it this time around. Um, so uh, in the first episode, I, I just I, I don't know what it was like while I was watching it at first, I got the impression that Jeremy Renner just didn't want to be there. And so it was just like really weird to watch this thing where like Haley Steinfeld is selling the heck out of like, you're so cool. I love you. And then he's just like, "Ah, get away from me. But watching it over again, um, that first episode, like, you know, getting to know him with the family, 
I like that. It was relatable. It worked. Um, and I guess like the one part where I was a little like confused is sort of like the early team up with Kate and uh, Clint because like he first sees her and he's like, ah, oh, come on. Like you're a kid. Right. <laughs> and then like the way that first scene of the two of them plays out is he seems like very like protective. Like, okay, you're a kid. Let's get you someplace. Right. And like, let like, I'm going to try to help you out here right now. And then like they walk off screen and into like a different street. And then all of a sudden the dynamic is, man, this kid's really annoying. It's mm -hmm. like, oh, ah. I feel like you should see that kind of like, oh my God, this kid, give me a break. Like you should probably see his patience waning down and that, you know, by the time you get to, can you sign my bow and arrow? That's when he's like, no, <laughs> like, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like you should see it kind of breaking down over like a couple of scenes. Um, and it does sort of seem like in one scene, he's one way. And then it just turns into like a completely different dynamic, the very next shot. Um, but I do like, but I do agree with what you said. I like his emotional journey throughout it. Um, I like seeing him growing more attached to Kate. I do like um, seeing him trying to uh, carry the burden on his shoulders without putting it on anybody else. And he's just not getting it done. Um, but I also like that you can kind of see why he feels that way. Right. Mm -hmm. Cause when he's trying to do stuff himself, like him trying to clear Kate's name, he almost does it, but if she just didn't get involved, he would have done it. And then she comes crashing through the skylight. Right. Mm -hmm. That's, that's good. Like I, I, I see where she's coming from. I see where he's coming from. I see why he's a little annoyed with her in the dynamic. It, it works. But I also, I, this was a detail I only caught on the second time around. I don't know if you noticed this. I like when he's at the urinal and he sees like somebody had vandalized it with a Sharpie and it, they wrote Thanos was right. Yeah. And then later he's drinking out of a mug in that apartment and mm -hmm. his mug is the Thanos was right mug. <laughs> yeah. That's kind of funny. I like that. Uh-huh. Um, and that's, I, I feel like that probably evolved out of like, weird internet stuff like there were people on the internet after infinity war saying thanos was right and maybe some of them were being ironic uh maybe some of them weren't uh i have a t-shirt that i regret uh that says magneto was right uh from grant morrison's new x-men uh i wore it to food lion once and the cashier asked me why magneto was right and instantly i was like I don't want to be here. I don't want to have this conversation. <laughs> I don't I don't want to explain uh, for 20 minutes why Magneto, you know, and and like I was just like uh and, and so yeah, um I, I feel I feel <laughs> like that was visualizing that scene in my head. <laughs> really um but yeah, I feel like the Thanos thing, they must have been like, "Hey, let's poke fun at the internet kind of." Like, let's do that a little bit. Um so I I did think that was funny. Um but uh I, let me look at my notes. I didn't type out everything I have in my brain, so I'm probably going to be kind of like struggling a little bit. Um, I uh, I was almost 1,000% sure that, uh, isn't there in the uh, in the vacation movies, the, the National Lampoon vacation movies, don't they like recast the kids in each movie? Um, is that yes. a thing they do? Okay, I was almost 1,000% sure that they were doing that here with Hawkeye's kids, but I looked them up and no, these kids were in in game and age of Ultron. But for some reason, every time I see them, I'm like, that's not the same daughter, is it? <laughs> um, and I don't know why I'm thinking that, but I just, for some reason, every time I see them, I'm like, this is a different kid, but it, it's the same ones. Um, uh, I, I, I want to get into a minor complaint. Um, I didn't think the LARPers were funny and I didn't want to see them become like major characters by the end of the, the season. Um, I, I guess maybe, I thought it was an okay little, like, a quick little subplot in one episode. Like, he, you know, he tries to get the costume, but one of the firefighters took it. And so, like, he can't get the costume in, like, episode two because then the series will be over. So you have to have something to kind of blockade him from finishing his, you know, you know, getting the costume, destroying it, and then going home. But I just... I didn't think the LARPers, it, it was fine in episode two. I think it was episode two. But then when they came back, I was like, oh, no, please, not not these guys again. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you what you felt felt about that. But by the end of the season, when they were like helping, uh, air quotes, helping, I was just like, I was about ready to just fast forward through all the scenes with them. Uh, I don't know how you felt. Oh, yeah. Well, so you touched on the LARPers and they are on a list I have. Um. I would say that um, I'm just going to quickly touch on what that list kind of is. I'll maybe get into it a little deeper, um, but uh, I think these Marvel shows are still struggling between 
being television and feeling like long movies. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think this is definitely better than stuff like Falcon and the Winter Soldier or Loki. I mean, it's not like three episodes you could just wholesale remove from this and it wouldn't be different. Um, But there are certain aspects where it does feel like the presence here feels like um, you need to make this either shorter by cutting these things or this show needs to be longer by fleshing this stuff out. Um, And that's what this list is. However, the one outlier on that list is the LARPers. The LARPers are here and it's like whenever they're around, it's like you can just feel the writers stretching the show with them to make it fill six hours. Mm -hmm. Um, And I like Grills. Grills is like this cool, uh, like kind of guy. And I I think the actor who is Clayton English, he's very likable and charismatic. um, But it's, it's, it's just kind of weird, the whole LARPing angle. Cause I can't tell if the show's making fun of them or being like kind of, uh, affectionate towards LARPing like it feels a little tonally confused there uh but also I mean just like come on like the this firefighter who's a LARPer is going to publicly post on Instagram himself in a costume that has been used in multiple crimes (laughs) yesterday (laughs) like what no no (laughs) that's not gonna happen well and I mean it it lines up with kind of the you you thought you weren't sure. I felt like the the show was kind of like like making fun of them. Like it it definitely feels to me like this is saying like look at these idiots. And, but like they're involved, but only because like I guess Clint doesn't want to call in whatever is left of the Avengers. But um, it seemed to me the show was kind of like you know pointing and laughing at them. Um, which well, I'm. He- I felt like it was pointing and laughing at them larping because Clint thinks it's stupid. Mm-hmm. And but then it's like, why would you involve them in the climax where you get you give them a hero shot that makes me want to cringe into like my grave? Like, ah, I don't know. Watching them LARP was just I, I, I thought it was a, a cringe worthy uh, is, is what the kids would say. No, they would just say cringe. OK, that's mm-hmm. what the kids would say. Um, I get the impression that. Um, so have you read the Matt Fraction run on Hawkeye? I have. It's been a while. Um, I read it. And then I believe Jeff Lemire or Jeff Lemire uh, wrote a, a brief run after that. I read that. And then I read like a very little bit of the like stuff that came like uh, right before Matt Fraction, um, like a, shortly after uh, Secret Invasion. But uh, yeah, sorry to answer your question. Yeah, I have read the, the Matt Fraction stuff. So I've read a few issues of it. I don't know if there are any LARPers in that, but I do know that a lot of that is about how Clint lives in an apartment building and the tracksuit mafia is kind of pushing on just the normal Joe Schmoes who live there. And he's kind of being a people of the hero by just helping out his local apartment complex. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, this felt like a way to try to adapt that because this is set in the MCU. They connect tracksuit mafia to, um, you know, Kingpin and like a larger thing where they're trying to steal stuff. And it's not about extorting Billy down the hall. It's about, you know, bigger score than that. But, I think they were trying to use the LARPers as a surrogate for like the people in the apartment complex where it is Hawkeye trying to do a solid for the working man or something. But I don't know. It it felt like when he's hanging out with them, they're cool people, but then they want to do some LARPing. (laughs) It's pretty stupid. Am I right? Mm -hmm. And that's where I felt it was confused. Like I can't tell if I'm supposed to like these people or think they're lame. Yeah. Um, I I was like there at the end. You, you have made the point that uh, with the MCU, they they feel the need to like give everybody something to do in the climax, um, and that never really bothered me before. Like you used the example of in uh, the Winter Soldier movie, you have Steve, Falcon, uh, Nick Fury, and Black Widow, and they all have to have something to do in the climax, and. Again, that didn't bother me in that movie because they're all pretty crucial in the movie. Like you, it'd be very difficult to remove Black Widow from that movie and still have the same plot. So you can't just say, 
and then she just kind of went to go answer a phone call and she missed out on the climax. So you mm-hmm. have to give something to each of those characters. So in uh, the case, I, I just want to jump in and quickly say, like, for that movie, I agree. Okay, yeah, yeah. It's based on the success of that movie where they said, now let's do it for every movie. Right, right. And I, yeah, that's a, thank you for clarifying. Um, And so, like, in this movie, or I'm sorry, in this six-hour movie, you have uh, the LARPers that he meets, he gets the suit, and then he lets them beat him in combat, and then it's like, yay, and then it's like, okay, see you guys around. Just kidding, I'm never going to see you again. And then we don't have to bring them back, but then... We need them because there's some uh, arrows that are in police lockup, and one of them is a police officer, and so we need their help. But then they say, okay, if we're going to help you, then we want to come and, like, bake cookies for you, and then we're going to help you uh, at Nakatomi Tower, and we're going to, you know, and then it's just like, why did you bring these guys here? None of them have any experience with dealing with terrorists, and, like, the whole, like— Clint is not sure if he wants to bring Kate into this life. He keeps telling her, like, this is dangerous. Uh, You could get killed. Like, I watched someone who is a trained professional die in this line of work. Like, are you sure you want to do this? And then they casually bring in some people who eat, like, you know, they just, like, hang out and, like, they hit each other with foam swords. And that's okay. Um, And, like, at the end, I I think the most cringe thing for me, if I can borrow some vernacular from the kids, uh, is... There's one part where the police are questioning some of the LARPers, and they're like, we're assistant Avengers. We're, we're kind of like Avengers. And I was thinking, wait, isn't one of them supposed to be a cop? And then she, <laughs> she, she's having a moment with uh, Swordmaster, a uh, Swordman, um, and, she, and she's talking with him. And I was thinking, why isn't she over there clearing everything with the officers who are questioning the other LARPers? And yeah. for that matter, like, they're in the building. They know something is going to go down. Again, isn't she a cop? Shouldn't she report that to her boss? <laughs> and, like, especially yeah, when... Yeah, she should be getting out of Dodge if you didn't call that one in. Yeah, uh, or, like, when gunfire is opened on the building... The very first thing she should do is call her supervisor and say, hey, I'm in a building at a Christmas party and there's some gunfire. Can you guys send a couple of units over? Like, and and again, like maybe they're thinking, well, that would take away from like Kate and Hawkeye if a thousand cops showed up to save the day because these bad guys are basically just regular bad guys with guns. And so the cops would be able to handle that pretty easily. But then don't have that lady be a cop. Like she, she says, uh, I, I, you know, you could have had any, like, you could say like, Hey, I'm, I don't just dress up like a bard, uh, when I'm over here hitting people with a sword. I also, you know, do cosplay and I have a police uniform and maybe Kate says, Hey, those trick arrows are in police custody. Can one of you go get them? Uh, sure. I can dress up like a cop, sneak in and get it. Um, and you know, she, she might say, Hey, it's dangerous. Uh, this you could get arrested and they're like no please you know Hawkeye is asking us for a favor we're totally going to do this and then you don't have this weirdo who for a living serves and protects and decides not to do that and instead decides to dress up like Glorthaf the orc to escort people out of the building yes so I I got issues with that because you're right like on top of it just being we need to find this is a Marvel thing we need to find a place for everybody in the climax. This is also a Disney Plus show, so we need to give an origin story for why they have their costumes. Mm-hmm. So now let's do both of it. So that's why they're in the climax. Otherwise, how else are you going to know they got their costumes? I mean, I know they said they were going to give them their costumes, but unless they're in the climax, I mean, you can't really know for certain that they that they got them. You know? Uh, yeah. I don't know. Like it's just those issues that are like, okay, this is a Disney Plus show, so. It kind of also serves as a six hour origin story for their costumes, but there's more going on here. And I like that, you know, as far as like the costumes are concerned, it seems like this thing that Kate is much more interested in because she is more interested in like, ooh, you're like a superhero. And he's just like, hey, kid, it's just my job, whatever. Are you there? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Oh, sorry, sorry. Um, I, I, thought, I thought you would cut out. Um, yeah, I. Uh, I kind of just liked that, like, Kate's costume is just her archery uniform, uh, and that was it. Um, But then I guess they wanted also Clint to have a similar costume, and I was always fine with uh, Clint just having, like, a black sleeveless uh, thing, like, like a kind of sort of leathery, like, I was always okay with that for him. Like, he's, he's a, like, former S.H.I.E.L.D. agent, like, I didn't need 
the costume from the comics and for them to like have to write in these incredibly annoying characters just to give him the costume kind of sort of what he has in the comics i didn't really need that um so that to me like i i understand that that was probably their big reason for writing them in but i that didn't that wasn't enough for me yeah no i i i agree um so outside of the larpers um we got a lot going on in this in this uh in this show and i and i think like I would say too much. And I think it becomes apparent that there's a little too much going on when you get to the final episode, um, where I think there is a perfect place for all the action to stop, and then it keeps going for 15 minutes. Um, okay. I, I think that when you have the two of them side by side, on the ice, firing arrows, that is a nice way to bring it all home, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but then we got to bring in the stuff with Kingpin, and then Yelena's got to fight, and then... You know, even though Kazi already fought Hawkeye earlier, now Kazi's got to fight Echo, and then Echo's got to confront a kingpin. And, uh, like, you know what I mean? It's like, okay. <sighs> All right. Um, it, it becomes, I think, a little too much going on. Um, and I think I got a list of things that you could either cut or just um, explore in a more television-friendly, longer-form way. Mm-hmm. I think that if this show was, like, 10 episodes... And you sort of split the stuff up. Let's say the first five episodes are about um, the tracksuit mafia and getting to know Kate and all that stuff, right? And mm-hmm. then the second half has to do with Elena and that stuff. Now, now that they've gone on an adventure together, maybe Elena shows up to sow doubt in um, in Kate. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I, I think something like that would probably be be better. But I think the first thing you could just straight up cut from this is the watch. You don't need it. Um, they say if you go digging into the watch, you'll find it, it'll lead back to to Hawkeye's wife and, and mm-hmm. his and his family. A how? It's just a watch with a shield logo on it. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know how like some weirdo collector is gonna go digging, but I guess Kingpin wanted it. I don't know why Kingpin wants it. Um, it's I guess connected to his wife, but I guess maybe the history with his wife is different than. Uh, Hawkeye's history as Ronin because Hawkeye's history as Ronin, his connection to Kingpin is that Kingpin tipped him off about Echo's father. So mm-hmm. I guess Kingpin didn't know that anything about Ronin because I guess if he also has history with some vague history with, with Hawkeye's wife, I don't know, like all of this is very nebulous because the point is it's just a MacGuffin, right? Right. Here's the I, problem. Go ahead. It's first of all, it is really uh, convenient that not one but three important personal items were not only found in the Avengers compound, but they were all also sold at the exact same auction. Um, <laughs> that being the Ronin sword, the Ronin costume, and the watch. But the real reason all of this could just be cut is because Echo is already looking into Clint's family just by virtue of him being there. Like when they when he gets kidnapped or like when he like purposely gets captured. Like there's a part where they just he talks to Echo and Kazi and then she's like, look, look into Clint Barton. Mm-hmm. And then she does. And then she also just has the Rolex by coincidence. Like having the Rolex did not make her look into Clint Barton. Um, I don't know. Like just having I don't know, just like having Echo looking into Clint, it makes the Rolex just completely pointless. And I guess it's only there because of some vague, well, Kingpin wants the Rolex, I guess. So we should just get rid of the Rolex before Kingpin can get his hands on it. That is so vague, though, that you could just cut it. I'm glad you're confused about the watch as well, because I like I look as soon as the series was over, I I guess my takeaway was, okay, Linda Cardellini was a S.H.I.E.L.D. agent. And I kind of like that because we didn't really know a lot about her. Um, You know, Age of Ultron, it's a big twist that he has a family. Um, and I didn't need an origin for how he met this woman, but it makes sense that if Clint was a S.H.I.E.L.D. agent, that he would have met her in his line of work, and she was also an agent, and then she retired, and he's still doing it. I, that makes sense to me. Um, but I saw a whole lot of people saying that this is going to be their way to bring Mockingbird into the MCU, and I, you've watched more Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. than I have. Didn't they already bring Mockingbird into Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D.? Yeah, but nobody cares. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, I, I, that's I, not canon, I guess. Yeah, um, uh, well, and okay, 
I've, I've mentioned this before. James Gunn once, like, apropos of nothing, said that the TV shows before Endgame aren't canon. And now I have no idea what to believe because Kingpin is in this. Daredevil is in No Way Home. And, I like, uh, Agent Coulson was in Captain Marvel. So they haven't forgotten that he exists, even though, like, he kind of got spun off into the movie or the TV-verse. But, like, and then also uh, Jarvis from uh, from Agent Carter shows up in uh, in uh in game so i i don't yeah. know like you know and i don't I know guess, if i guess we got red tape if you're a television show that was on netflix you might be canon if you were popular enough yeah uh, and or i mean if this is even the same version it could just be the same actors a la jk simmons right or it could be multiverse crap a la you know alfred molina or it you know or you know if, if you were not on Netflix, you're not canon unless you were in Agent Carter, in which case you are canon because mm. that was based. That show was based on the the short one shot Agent Carter, so it is canon. It's a it's a it's crap. <laughs> like, yeah, all oh, oh, this is so stupid. Um, um, but yeah, I agree with you. The watch confused me. Um, I'm okay with the reveal. I think it's a reveal that Linda Cardellini was an agent of Shield. Um, I I kind of like yeah. that. I just didn't like the watch. It was confusing, and it it kind of it felt to me like this is a backdoor pilot for something. But we're not going to reveal what that is right now. Um, and it was just kind of confusing to me. It it didn't feel like it get wrapped up enough in this show. Yeah, I mean, I guess it. Here's the thing, though. Like, I, I guess, yeah, she could be a shield agent. I think that's kind of a neat backstory for maybe her and how she and Clint got to know each other. Um, that being said, it could also just be, I like this Rolex. You know, I like the shield logo engraved in it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I, I don't know. Like, it, it's really, and I, I don't need the show to be about the watch, which is why you should just cut the watch. Mm-hmm. Um, but another thing, I feel like you could just remove. Uh, from this is Jack, uh, the Jack Duquesne, uh, as but I feel like you could what I when I say you could cut him, I'm saying you should cut him as a red herring, um, as early as he is because he's sort of like you know, public enemy number one for Kate from the get go. Mm-hmm. And I think maybe if you brought him up as a suspect, say at the end of episode three when they're like you know, hacking into files, that's when you should do that. Um, that's when you should maybe raise suspicion of him as a um, as a red herring. The problem I had was that in those early episodes, she has these suspicions about him, and it's always in a, the previously on segment at the beginning of the show. Um, but whenever Jack is not on screen, I feel like I, I, I'm he, he's not even on my radar. Mm-hmm. It's like it seems like this kind of a, the, the, this element of the story that is just so far on the back burner that it might as well just not even be there. Um, and if maybe she's like, well, I don't like that. My mom is engaged to somebody that I don't even know. And it all happens super fast. And maybe he's only after her for her money, but he seems to make her happy. Yeah. I'm not sure about this guy. Put a pin in that. And then later you come up with actually, maybe he's a secret villain. And then she's like, oh, I want to take him out. And then turns out he was a red herring. It was actually her mom the whole time. Right. Mm -hmm. That I think would be a better way of structuring this because the Jack angle does sort of. I think it just kind of adds a little too many uh, stokes in the fire from the get-go. Yeah, um, I found myself, I was really rooting for Jack because, like, he simultaneously is able to pull off, like, the sinister, like, hello, Kate. But also, I was like, and he has, like, the most evil-looking mustache I have ever seen (laughs) in anything um like when when you talk about like a mustache twirling bad guy this is the mustache they're talking about like um if they if they don't ever make a uh uh wacky races uh movie uh this guy needs to play uh snidely whiplash from the from that whole um but uh at the same time i find him really charming and like when he gives her like the the what do you call it the the gumdrop i'm like you know I don't trust him, but I I like him, uh, even though I don't trust him. And after we find out that he's innocent, like he has one of my favorite lines in the whole series is when uh, is he talking to Armand the fourth in the last episode? Or is that just some is that a different kid? 
Um, so that's Armand the seventh. <laughs> or, or the seventh. Okay, yeah. Okay, so Armand the seventh is talking to him again, and he, they're kind of arguing because Armand the seventh is like, I was hoping that you would stay in jail. And then uh, Jacques says, remember when you peed your pants at the Hamptons? I remember. Everyone remembers. I was just <laughs> dying. Like, I, there's something so cathartic about adults who can just unleash all their savagery on a child and like with no repercussions and like i wish i could do it <laughs> myself um and so i i love that um but you're right like he's there to throw off suspicion and here's the problem i've seen bates motel i have been conditioned to not trust vera formiga um <laughs> i already know she's a bad guy you can't make me think that she's not um i like i i just because at the very beginning of the of the series, we're set in 2012, right before the alien invasion starts in Avengers, and Vera Vera is arguing with uh, the guy who played Shrek in Shrek the Musical, and um, <laughs> and then like they're arguing about something, and one of them says we should just sell this house, and then we cut forward to the present day. Oh, well, and I guess Shrek dies in the alien invasion, and <laughs> and then. Um, she then we cut forward to the present day and then it's like we're expected to forget that there was this argument going on and so in the back of my mind even though we haven't seen it for like six hours i'm still thinking okay what was the deal with that argument what was that all about and so like and, and any good mystery is going to give you something to fixate on to distract you from the real threat uh, that you know, red herring and so since kate and the show wants you to like he's at a black market auction, so clear, you know, he's he's up to no good, right? And he said, like, he's talking to Armand the Third, and Armand the Third says, "You don't have three hundred thousand dollars," and he says, "Hmm, but what if I inherited it? Hmm, and the only way I can inherit it is if you die. Hmm, and then he dies like ten minutes later, and so it's it's definitely like making you think, okay, this guy is evil. Um, and I I would even say maybe it doesn't play entirely fair with that because like. When if you say to someone that you are the heir to, I can't wait to inherit this money. Like you're definitely like that. That's a little shady. But like, I was still kind of thinking, okay, there's something going on with the mom. Like I, I don't know if that was just me or if uh, if other people picked up on that as well. Um. Yeah. I and I feel like there was just kind of so much going on that that mystery angle was, um, a little diluted. Mm -hmm. And but I also think that the mystery doesn't have enough people to really be a super compelling mystery so you should probably make it as subplot on the back burner like they did <laughs> um yeah i don't know um for me i never bought uh armand as a um as a a villain because i just thought tony dalton was just so charming and likable mm -hmm. like you know what i mean like i it was almost like he did too good of a job like yeah. he was so dang likable and like even you said he had a big evil mustache and that made me laugh quite heartily he was just so cozy and welcoming and so affable and just roll, rolling with the punches that like, I was like, I, this is a red herring. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he's, he's too nice. Um, but I also, um, and, and, you know, you were talking about like how it worked for you. And I think like that just kind of comes down to what I was saying earlier is I think the casting here is really good. Um, he's like inspired casting. I've never seen that guy in anything before, or at least I don't think I have. Um, but immediately he jumped out to me as a standout. I think, you know, Vera Farmiga is good in everything. Uh, she's really good in this kind of playing like the... I, I like that monologue she has in the first episode where she's like, look, Kate, rich people think they're invincible and young people think they're invincible and you've always been both. Mm -hmm. And she's like, but take it from somebody who is not, like you're not. And, and and she has that kind of like that tough, like she knows how to talk to her child in a way that's like loving, but also like tough and stern because she understands who her daughter is. Um I like the way, like, you know, when she's, like, with uh, her fiancé, like, you kind of do see her heart melting, even though she basically just suckered this guy in to dupe him. Mm -hmm. um, like, I don't know, and I also like when she's talking to Kingpin at the beginning of the last episode where she's like, look, I, I'm i not, like, a bad person. I just did this to get out of debt, you know what I mean? And it kind of does go back to, even though she's rich, she does kind of have that relatable working class problem of debt, you know what I mean? And, mm -hmm. and I like that. I, I think that... Um, Vera Farmiga sells it and a lot of the casting like I've been kind of just saying uh, it, it's doing a lot of the heavy lifting because the, the what's here on the paper is good enough right like you could have had less good actors here and it would be satisfying um, or it, it would be adequate uh, but I think with the actors they have they, they, they sell it in a way that 
well, it's the only one I've only one of these Marvel shows I've watched twice. And I think yeah. that says something. Uh, yeah, um, I uh, I also liked uh, since we're talking about Jacques um, when the, he has the sword fight with Kate and then uh, mom is yelling at Kate for trying to stab him in the face and he defends Kate. He says, they're there. I did fake my skill and lie about it multiple times. <laughs> and I, was, I don't know. You're right. He is very charming. Um, I like him. Um, I. If I may add something to your list, um, this may be a, a hot take. I think they could have cut Kingpin from the show because um, he doesn't show up until. Well, OK, there's which which episode is it where we start with a flashback of Echo? That is the third episode. OK, so we see uh, Crow Daddy from Dr. Sleep is talking <laughs> with his daughter and uh, he, he says, and by the way, uncle is going to come and pick you up. And then we see somebody, we don't see their face reach out and, and they're wearing a nice suit like they, you, know, you see there's lapel buttons on it and everything he reaches out kind of touches her face and then he uh, uh, uh you know the that's my uh i'm sorry uh, uh what's, what's that uh actor's name um vincent this, d'onofrio yeah that's my vincent d'onofrio laugh um when they, well it's funny you say that because I, I i don't remember that little chuckle from like the i think that might have been added after the whole thing was done Oh, okay. Like, um, I, I noticed the weird chuckle, too. I was like, wait, what? I don't remember that. <laughs> um, but uh, then we don't see Kingpin. We, we, at the very end of episode five, uh, Yelena is following Kate's mom for some reason. Uh, I was a little confused about that. Maybe you can help me figure this out. So Yelena tells Kate, hey, I'm here to kill Hawkeye. And then the next thing we know, Eleanor Bishop is walking through the city and Yelena is following her. And then she texts Kate and says, I found out who hired me. It was your mom. And then she sends her a video of Eleanor Bishop talking to Kingpin. How did Yelena know to follow Kate's mom? Do you do you know that? Is that did I miss something? No, I. Okay. It, so. Uh, yeah, because I know you're trying to talk about how you think Kingpin might have been cut. You're tapping into the the last person on my list, and that is. Yelena should have been cut from the show. Um, yeah, yeah. And go right ahead. I, know, uh, I can get back to Kingpin later. Okay. I think, yeah, because like there's there's almost like an order to this. We got to get into the Yelena before we can get into the Kingpin. Mm -hmm. um, look, Florence Pugh is a great actress. She's very mm -hmm. likable. And she also looks like Florence Pugh. I don't... Mm -hmm. I, I, <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> so I, 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 it's with a heavy heart, I say, you should cut Yelena. But... Um, you should because a like there's it i have seen black widow and you have seen black widow and um we've seen the the god awful post credit scene of black widow mm -hmm. which is setting up that elaine is telling uh yelena whoa okay julia louis dreyfus is telling yelena that um yeah, your your sister's dead, and somehow Hawkeye is responsible. And she's like, "I'm going, I'm going to kill Hawkeye." And then that's the last we see. And then at the end of episode four of this, she shows up, and you're like, "Ah, this is a payoff, right?" Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, and then in episode five, in the world's longest scene that has ever been put to film, uh, they're sitting like uh, Yelena is sitting down, and Kate. Um, apartment and they're just like sitting there having a conversation over some mac and cheese and she's basically saying um, I'm I'm here to kill Hawkeye because he's responsible for my sister's death and and then it, this conversation is weird because she's saying like how well do you know Clint how long have you known him and she's like only a few days <sighs> she's like trust me Clint is a bad guy but but Yelena, you also don't know Clint. <laughs> so it's weird. It feels like this like weird conversation where Kate does know Clint better than probably anyone else who's not a member of his family. And like also, we later come to find out Yelena doesn't even know who hired her. Mm -hmm. And so somehow through that conversation, she feels motivated to like say, I'm going to go investigate who hired me. And then she finds out that it is Eleanor Bishop. And then she finds out that he's involved with the Kingpin. And then she's also still trying to kill Hawkeye. Mm -hmm. And I'm just sitting here thinking, so how does Julia Louis-Dreyfus play into any of this? Yeah. You know I mean? My, I, 
of course, it doesn't make sense, but and I guess we're left to kind of put it together. I assumed that the post credit scene uh, from Black Widow takes place. And this doesn't make sense because Elena is visiting the grave of Natasha. And you would think she would be doing that like right after the blip or, 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 or at least, you know, like or at least right after the Avengers tell the world that she's dead. And I don't, this takes place in Christmas of probably the first Christmas after Endgame, maybe. And so I don't- It would have to be because okay. um, in, in No Way Home, uh, you see ads for uh, Rogers the Musical, so. Oh, okay. Um, probably around the same time. Okay, uh, so the, um, it, she is visiting Natasha's grave and I assumed that Eleanor Bishop just put like uh, feelers out in the criminal underworld, like, hey, I need somebody to kill Hawkeye. And then Elaine from Seinfeld said, oh, I know who can do that. And then she goes and finds Yelena wherever Natasha was buried and uh, or, or not, you know, where the gravestone was. And that's my assumption. But I like wherever Yelena was, it wasn't it wasn't snow on the ground. So I don't know if that was supposed to be like like if you were to do like a, a fan edit and put that post credit scene somewhere in between episodes of Hawkeye like I don't know if that would work or if this is something kind of like what they used to do on the post credit scenes where like you know how in the first Thor movie uh Loki has fallen off the rainbow bridge and then uh Dr. Uh, Selvig is looking at the cube and then uh Loki says or we see like Loki's reflection and he says well that's something isn't it and then Dr. Selvig says well that's something isn't it and so it's like oh Loki is like possessing Dr. Selvig but then you get to the first Avengers movie and Loki jumps out of a portal and immediately touches Dr. Selvig with his staff and then he's able to possess Dr. Selvig right then and there. And so then you look at the post credit scene from Thor and you look at what happens in Avengers and it's like, wait a minute, that doesn't make any sense. Like those two don't really work together. Yeah. And and it, it feels like that, where it feels like somebody told the director and the screenwriter of Black Widow, Yelena is going to team up with slash want to kill Hawkeye. Figure it out, do a post credit scene. And so they do something and then uh, they like the people making Hawkeye were probably already knee deep in making Hawkeye when that post credit scene was being written slash filmed. And so they didn't watch the post credit scene. And so these don't really work together. Um, even you can maybe try to finagle it in a way, but you're right. Like when you're watching this, the, there's no mention of Elaine from Seinfeld. And so we don't know how she figures in if she even does. Well, and I understand that due to COVID, a lot of things got moved around, right? Mm -hmm. Apparently, uh, Elaine was supposed to be introduced in Black Widow, but her presence in Black Widow was altered because they now introduced her in Falcon the Winter Soldier. Um, and so they maybe already shot that scene with uh, at the grave site before they had to switch stuff around. Mm -hmm. I don't know, right? Projects got moved around. It happened, right? It, it, it was fine. But regardless, when you're just looking at this as its own thing, it's it's just weird that in like the difference between I think something like Thor and this, and I know you're not making the argument that you know it's fine, but like to this hypothetical person who is telling me it's fine, and I'm gonna say it's probably not as fine, okay. is just that Thor was in phase one. They were still trying to work the kinks out, right? And there were a few of those post credit scenes that didn't really work or like didn't really actually materialize the way you figured it would. But like the Incredible then, Hulk. You like exactly. I was just about to say that. Yeah, precisely. Great. Um, but when it comes to this, though, it's like you're having characters from the show showing up in a movie, and now this character in a movie is going to show up in a show. It's like there's like this, you know. Now they're cross pollinating with one another. There's like a level of confidence in your continuity, and not only that, but in this show, we are getting flashbacks to films to suggest that the way you saw it in that film is the way it happened for these characters. Like the continuity is one-to-one, -one, right? Mm -hmm. Nothing got dropped. So if Yelena exists and we're having flashbacks to the Black Widow movie, I'm going to assume that post credit scene that featured a character from another one of these shows that's on this Disney Plus platform happened. But it's just weird that when you're watching this, did Eleanor hire her? Like the way it plays out is it's like Vera Farmiga straight up directly hired Florence Pugh. And there was no middleman. 
And she was like, I don't know who hired me. Also, mm-hmm. I'm going to make these bold claims that I know exactly what kind of person Clint is. <laughs> and it's, I don't know, like, I, I feel like all that's messy and not very well thought out. But it also has a very frustrating payoff for me, which is Hawkeye is, Black Widow is this guilt he has, right? And that is a good angle to have. I like the idea of while we're introducing a new Hawkeye, we got to have a new Hawkeye and a new um, Black Widow kind of teaming up. And they're probably going to be buddy-buddy the same way Clint and Natasha were. Um, I like that. I like their costumes. I think their dynamic is great. They have great chemistry. Um, you know, awesome. I, I could I could watch their dynamic all day. Mm-hmm. However, um, the way we do the new Black Widow with the old Hawkeye doesn't... That's the part that I'm a little, like, shrugging my shoulders at because it's just weird when you have Clint being possessed with this guilt about Natasha. And then not only is it another Black Widow, it is Yelena. It is mm-hmm. Natasha's sister that he has heard of and has probably seen pictures of. You know what I mean? Like, and then at the end when she's like beating him up and is like, you took my sister from me, wow, or whatever. And then he doesn't just finally have like this moment of confession and just explain the scenario to her and like just try to like, purge this demon that's been like haunting him and then maybe he and yelena can have that cathartic moment you don't get that he's just like hey you wouldn't believe me if i told you <laughs> like what no <laughs> i love like, how your your jeremy renner is slowly devolved into like uh joe pesci from home alone like <laughs> <laughs> um you know yeah what? I, uh, we already did a home alone reboot but uh, you know, did a remake of it jeremy renner would be a pretty good <laughs> marv yeah um, I, so there's a couple of problems. I like, there's a lot of problems I have with the final episode, but that fight scene between Yelena and Hawkeye and, and Clint, it kind of reminded me of Batman versus Superman. And that's never a good way to start a conversation, but like, <laughs> um, you know how like in Batman versus Superman, like Superman has like multiple opportunities to say, Lex Luthor kidnapped my mom. Can you help me please? Um, like yeah. he could have said that and, and this, like, Clint is trying to tell her, no, I didn't kill your sister. And she says, well, you're a liar. And then finally he does the little whistle thing that was in uh, uh, Black Widow, the movie. And then that's like, that's the equivalent of you have to save Martha. And I was like, okay, like, yes, it would have been silly if Clint said, okay, we were on this planet and the Red Skull told us that one of us had to jump (laughs) off a cliff. Like that would have been really silly. And I was expecting them to do that. And I was expecting to like laugh and also be like, oh, this is silly. But like he just said you wouldn't believe me. And also that would take like 10 minutes to explain. And we but, but even though have him explain, like, look, it came down to like she sacrificed herself. I mm-hmm. tried to sacrifice myself in her place and she got the better of me. She was always better than me. And that proved it. Right. And like, yeah. you know, like explain it in a dramatic, emotional, cathartic way that like connects to him emotionally. Why was that emotional for him? It's because he wanted to sacrifice himself and, and and she bested him and wouldn't let him sacrifice. And like, that's like a thing he wishes he could take back. And, mm. and like, you know what I mean? Now it's like, it, get that off your chest. You don't have to explain what a soul stone is and like yeah. what where Vormir is and why well, Voldemort's there. Like, you don't have to do all that. <laughs> well, and he did. He said all that. He said, you know, she was better to me. Uh, she sacrificed herself. Uh, and then she's like, I don't believe you. Well, they should have just had her be like, yeah, that does kind of sound like Natasha. And then, like, she can kind of think back to, like, um, well, I saw you, like, try to jump off a building to save Kate. That was pretty cool. Like, you know, she says, like, Kate earned some points for jumping into traffic to save a dog. Like, yeah. she could probably say something like that. Like, you know, Clint, I I, I kind of have grown to not like you these this past however many minutes it's been since Endgame. But, you know, you're, maybe you're not as bad as I thought. But, like... Well, um, it's like, why does she think he's bad? Because Elaine told him yeah. that he's responsible for her sister's death. And, like, what does him whistling do? Like, it just kind of proves that he knew who Natasha was. Yeah, she kind of knew that, right? Yeah, that yeah. Why you're as pissed off at him as you are? Like, ah, I don't know. I feel like all of that is just, it's, it's, I like what it's trying to do on an idea level. Mm-hmm. There's just not nearly enough time to, like, do anything with it that would actually kind of dig into some stuff uh, because Yelena, you know, maybe, I don't know, like she's a little irrational, but like, she's also really upset about her sister being dead and that's understandable. And 
I don't know, like make that the back half of your show where maybe Yelena doesn't really want to confront Clint about it. And he's like maybe whispering stuff into Kate's ear and is like, maybe Clint doesn't know that Yelena's getting to Kate. And now, he, you know, Yelena's trying to turn Kate against him. And then the actual ending of the show or whatever story arc is that, you know, now they all got to like, it's Hawkeye versus Hawkeye and Black Widow or something. I don't know. Mm-hmm. And I agree with you. Them trying to do this in six episodes, there, there's a lot here that they either don't have enough time for or it just doesn't work. Um, I think they needed th- – this whole season could have been Yelena is trying to – like. Uh, like you could have taken out the tracksuit mafia echo and kingpin and this could have just been yelena is mad that natasha is dead and clint is mad that natasha's dead he feels guilty and then like he's you know trying to make it you know like maybe that would have been a stretch to make that six episodes but they basically boil it down to like 10 minutes and that's not enough time yeah you're right i mean it could have been entirely that but i do think that the um the the uh the tracksuit mafia angle is a good way of of uh doing it like a first season of the hawkeye show because mm-hmm. what i like about what this show did is that it takes the ronin stuff from endgame and actually like talks about it and kind of goes into like the regrets he has and like him being ronin kind of motivates all of the action that's going on if he wasn't ronin then you wouldn't have the tracksuit mafia trying to get the uh you know get the suit or whatever right and or i guess they're there to try to get the watch but at the watchers or at that auction with the watchers conveniently the ronin costume that conveniently Haley steinfeld puts on to hide her identity so that the tracksuit mafia that conveniently also has history with the ronin will now be a little uh you know upset that um that the Ronin's back and they have like a grudge or whatever. And now Echo wants to go after that. Like that's really the only reason the Rolex is even here is for something that the tracksuit mafia can, can try to acquire that conveniently the Ronin costume is also at. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I, you're, you're right. Um, so what, uh, would you care to move down on your list? Um, cause I, I can always get back to the Kingpin stuff later. I kind of got that tucked away in my brain. Well, actually, uh, that's sort of the end of my list. Um, but go go into Kingpin. Let, let's okay. do it. Well, here's the thing. Like, you know, way back when James Gunn said, like, none of this other stuff counts and matters, I was upset, especially since I spent, like, a year and a half watching the Marvel Netflix shows. Like, I, I mean, I was only watching, like, one, maybe two episodes a night. But, like, I was... I spent so much time investing myself into that corner of the MCU. I was going to be livid if they said, just kidding, it doesn't count. It doesn't, like, forget all that. Um, so even the stuff I didn't like, I, I was like, no, no, you don't put that away. Don't tell us that Iron Fist didn't happen. I, I watched it for a reason. It happened. Um, that uh, Sorry, I'm just, I, I sound like um, uh, Nero from the 2009 Star Trek. <laughs> um, but the... Uh, so I I was totally on board. Now, I haven't seen Spider-Man No Way Home, but I was totally on board with Charlie Cox showing up to say, like, hey, I'm a lawyer. And then, like, Kingpin, I, I'm okay with that. But they they tease him at the end of episode five, and then he shows up for maybe 15 minutes in episode six. And then, spoilers, Echo shoots him in the face. Why would you bring him back if you're just going to immediately kill him off? That's a good question. I don't think they killed him off. Okay. Um, because comic book thing. But I have to go and have like my uh, my comic book friends, or I guess my Marvel comics friends, have to tell me that that's actually a thing from the comics. But it does kind of feel like they just killed him off. Yeah. Well, she sh- she points a gun in his face, and then it cuts away, and we hear a gunshot. So unless Echo just decided to forgive him for having her dad killed. And then she decides, just kidding, I'm not going to shoot you in the face. I like I see no way he could have survived that. Um, well, and- in the apparently it's a thing in the comics, some storyline where um, Echo shoots him in the face and he's blind. And he's okay. like, he has like stuff over his eyes. So I guess it's like a blind kingpin and a blind daredevil. And oh, okay. Echo, Echo you can see, but, you know, she's deaf. So, you know, it's kind of like I- a thing in parallel them with. I want, I want, <laughs> I want uh, five superheroes to be the five senses. Uh, <laughs> Daredevil and Echo and somebody who can't smell, uh, somebody who has lost Hel- their sense of touch. 
Um, <laughs> Holland I, March from uh, the Nice Guys, uh, Ryan Gosling's character who can't smell. He should be there. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, uh, the villain from The World Is Not Enough who can't feel anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, but Kingpin, so at one point, uh, so I was a little confused because when we see the flashback where Echo sees Ronan cutting through everyone, I actually thought this was like at one point when I was kind of hedging my bets and I was thinking that uh, that Jock was actually going to be a bad guy. I I thought, or or I thought that like Eleanor was like, I thought somebody was in a Ronin costume and killed her dad. I, I And then at the end, it's like, oh, I guess Hawkeye actually did kill her dad. And I'm still, here's the thing, okay? Uh, I, I really liked Endgame. I think it did a really good job uh, juggling a lot of balls, um, and there was several emotional arcs that I think it did a pretty solid job on, uh, but I've seen several videos of people suggesting ways that that movie could have been improved, and I think I agree with almost all of them, even though I think that movie was really good, um, and they had a whole lot that they were trying to do, and I think they did a really good job with it all. There's stuff, like, I'm a little confused, like, in this, in this show, Hawkeye says, everyone dealt with the blip in their own way, and I was thinking, yeah, but why did you, like, Echo's dad didn't have anything to do with the blip. So why did you kill him? Like, he, we just see him at one point in Endgame where he's, like, assassinating criminals. And then Black Widow comes and says, hey, come back. And he says, oh, okay. And, like, I'm, I'm still a little confused on why he decided I'm going to suddenly cross the line in Endgame. Or rather, in between Infinity War and Endgame. And I get it. Like, he lost his family. But none of these people he's killing had anything to do with that. And so even here, like, they just kind of skip over that. And, like, he's trying to cover up his mess, but I don't, I still don't know why he made the mess, if that makes sense. No, you're right. Like, that is, a, I gotta be honest, I wasn't even thinking about that until you were mentioning it. And you are right. They don't explain why he even became Ronan in the, in the first place. And I think, you know, looking at, their their economy of like okay we have this much time to tell this much story um i think the show ultimately makes the right decision in you know what let's not explain why he became the ronin he's not the ronin anymore let's just have him haunted by what he did as the ronin and have to kind of pay the consequences and try to amend for that um you know sure i i think it's it's good enough you are right though at some point and maybe this actually was probably the place to do it i just, I just don't really trust marvel as a way of i don't know i don't trust marvel to actually go this above and beyond to make this good like like really really like good um and and it's like why did he like because it's weird it's like the ronin specifically was apparently going after organized crime right so it makes sense okay if, if someone's going after organized crime they probably go after tracksuit mafia which means they cross kingpin okay cool fine but why is he going after organized crime like he like Clint Barton's a secret agent. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like his ambitions would be a little higher than organized crime. Um, and yeah, why did he do that? We don't know. And I think they don't really know either. <laughs> I think that's why you throw in a, we all dealt with the blip in our own way as a catch-all excuse. No, that's a good observation. I didn't think about that. Yeah. Um, but so I was thinking, okay, we're going to have like a classic misunderstanding where Echo thinks that it was Clint, but it was actually like someone else and they don't do that. And so can you tell me why, why Echo is in this show? Like I, so she is mad that her dad died and, but then also the show, like in the last episode, she tells Kazi, we could just run away together. And I was thinking, wait, what has this been a thing in the previous five episodes? Like, we we have at no point have we seen her talk about how she just wants to get away from a life of crime and run away with this guy. Like they've been close. They've been closer than anyone else in the tracksuit mafia. But she in the last episode says that she and him could run away. And that has never been addressed up until now. Um, and like her whole thing has been getting revenge. And then she finds out, well, someone else was responsible. But then the guy who actually pulled the trigger on her dad is still out there. And she seems to have forgotten that. And I saw someone post somewhere that maybe they're kind of sort of thinking of doing an echo spinoff and no, I'll, they've announced it. Okay. I'm confused. Why? Um, like, <laughs> I don't want to say that like, she's a bad actress, but 
all we see from her is resting female dog face. Like, like she she's good at playing angry, I guess. But that's all we get from her. I, I don't think there's enough of this character to warrant getting a spinoff. Um, I like I just don't know what they're going to do with her. Is she going to continue being a crime lord, or is she going? Was she a crime lord? What her dad was obviously involved with organized crime. Was she involved, or was her dad's death what got her involved with the tracksuit mafia, and she wasn't with them before? Um, well, I, her I, daddy was obviously involved because I mean, yeah. You know, she's like, I miss my dad. And then right. Kingpin's like, we we all do. And yeah, like, so he, I guess, he was I guess definitely involved. She calls was, him she calls him uncle, like even when she's a little girl. So Yeah. yeah. But I, I guess I wasn't sure was she living a basically normal life, like doing, you know, practicing kickboxing or whatever, and then her dad dies, and then she takes over the tracksuit mafia for him. And so this was like what we're seeing here is like the first time that she's involved in crime, and then she I, I just I don't know what they're going to do with her. Like if she, you know, yeah, what is well, her... I feel like what you do with a Echo spinoff show, they they got rid of that at the end of the show. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean. Where it's like, oh, now you know she's gonna try to take down the kingpin. Oh, oh, I I guess I guess not. She already yeah. got that cathartic moment where she shoots him in the face, presumably. Mm-hmm. And I don't know. It's like, okay, let me let me just say. When I'm watching this show, I actually really like Echo. I find the actress very compelling. Um, you and my brother had a very similar response where you just did not get anything from her. Um, myself, though, like, I don't know. Like, I thought her whole flashback was really kind of neat. It was effective character building. Um, I, I kind of get her drive and determination. Um, I don't really buy that she wouldn't have thought about why Kazi wasn't at that meeting that night. I feel like... Mm-hmm. She would have already thought of that, but okay, whatever. That's, I guess, you know, a little problem I can get over. But um, I don't know. I, I just, when you just asked the why is she in the show, though, my initial reaction was, ah, bleh, bleh. and then I, I held my tongue and I had to think about it. I don't really know why she is in this show. And I think it's probably to give, like, the tracksuit mafia, they're, they're kind of comedic, right? They all mm-hmm. wear tracksuits and they all say bro. Um, but then I'm thinking, why can't you just combine her and Kazi into one character and make it either Kazi or, or, uh, Echo, you know what I'm saying? Like, why, why have it be this way, I guess is a good question. Um, no, I didn't think about that. Well, and maybe cause they want, like they start off where it's just the tracksuit mafia, but those guys are like faceless, like Cobra from G.I. Joe. Like, it's just a whole bunch of generic guys who are all bad. And so you need, like, a leader to, you know, a face uh, to be the bad guy. So then they introduce Echo. Is it at the end of episode two where we see her uh, listening to the music? Yeah. Um, yeah. And, but then, like, she, you know, she's trying to find who killed her dad, which is Hawkeye. And, like, we know it's Hawkeye. Well, now we do. Um, You know, it's, and so... I feel like they they just kind of leave that open, um, and like you said, like we've already said, like I, we still don't really know why Hawkeye was killing people, uh, and but then also they want to have a big twist ending of look, Kingpin is here, and I think they could have just said like Kingpin is in charge of the tracksuit mafia, and then Echo could be like, because we see like when Eleanor says I want out, my daughter is in danger. And then Kingpin doesn't take that well. And so he says, okay, we need to kill Eleanor. You could have done something kind of like that with Echo, where she she never approved of her dad being a criminal, but maybe maybe he was kind of in a similar situation to Eleanor, where Crow Daddy was in debt or something. And so he felt like, I have to work with Kingpin. He's not going to let me just walk away once I pay my debt. And so, like, maybe she wanted out. And so, like, I don't know. Like, there's ways you could have done it. And, and they do try to kind of parallel because this show introduces that Hawkeye needs a hearing aid. Um, and as far as I know, that was never a thing. I, I think that was a thing in the comics, like back in the eighties, maybe. But um, as far as I know in the MCU, this is the first time we're seeing that. Um, but then she's deaf and he's hard of hearing. And so I guess there's like potential for them to do something there, but all they do is she says, you rely too much on your hearing aid and then she breaks it and then that's it. And then they don't have like, there's nothing else there. Um, and yeah. And like, it doesn't even set up a whole, like 
Clint doesn't even think about technology for the <laughs> rest of the show. Right. That is kind of like um, a weird dynamic to set up. Yeah, you're right. And, you know, I'm I'm probably coming off as too much of a curmudgeon. Like, I'm sure somebody out there is saying it's really awesome that there is a deaf character. There's somebody out there who is deaf, and they are they very much appreciate that there is a, a deaf character in the show, uh, representation. And I don't know if they're using real American Sign Language. Um, I, you and I, I think we both like the movie The Shape of Water. I heard someone say that they don't use real sign language in that movie. I don't know because I don't know sign language, but I I don't know if they're using real sign language here either. But uh, yeah, I'm sure someone out there is appreciative of what they're doing. But I just don't think they put any thought into this character or really tried very hard at all. Um, I, I, I think there's something they could have done, but she just kind of fell flat for me. Okay. And, I mean, you pointing all this out, like, I have no counter arguments. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess I, I just found the actress compelling. Um, compelling enough that when I was watching it, I wasn't thinking about all that stuff. And I feel like all that stuff you laid out is stuff I'm always thinking about when I'm watching Marvel stuff. Um, yeah. And I'll be right. Like, they do, like, have her there and set stuff up that they just don't do anything with also it is kind of weird that so based on this character is just like you're right like there isn't really a whole lot to get like when he unmasks himself as ronin after he bests her and he's like all right um i beat you that means don't come looking for my family Mm -hmm. because i'll beat you i don't i don't understand why she wouldn't respond with oh yeah 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 okay and then she says okay i now know who ronin is everybody get as many machine guns as you possibly can Mm -hmm. because we might have like this whole honor code thing but we're just gonna like blow up his family's home while he's there like why why, what stopped her from doing that i mean you Mm -hmm. could say it's some honor code thing but we know she's good at like martial arts but i don't know if she's internalized like the morals that come with martial arts or not right because she's like in a mafia you know what i mean like I, I i don't know you're right it's very ill-defined and then he almost seems to like bargain with her where he's like all right i'm not gonna kill you and i'm actually gonna let you know that someone tipped me off and it was it was the person you work for why doesn't she go okay i'm gonna plot my revenge first i'm gonna kill ronan <laughs> and then i'm gonna kill hot like uh, kingpin you know what i mean like why is her response to just be like whoa i'm 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 cool with hawkeye now yeah, I get that. Yeah, I um and and like I was still kind of questioning cuz there I guess because Hawkeye said that Kingpin tipped him off that that definitely happened, but I was thinking well that could have just as easily been him just trying to throw her for a loop to get her like, you know, have you seen yes. the, two, yeah. the 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 Thomas Jane Punisher movie? I've not actually. Oh, okay, seen. there's a lot of that where uh, the Punisher is trying to put the bad guys he's trying to take down against each other uh, and have them kind of take themselves out. And I thought, oh, Hawkeye's doing that. He's like thinking with his brain instead of his fists. But then uh, I'm assuming that Kingpin actually did want Crow Daddy out of the picture, but I don't know why. Um, does he just want a bigger piece of the pie? And so he just eliminated, uh, like, this is a guy who who took one of his allies and decapitated him with a car door. Like, d- why did he send Ronan to kill Crow Daddy? Why, why couldn't he do it himself? Um, and that's led to, I know a few of my friends really don't like the way Kingpin was handled in this show. They don't feel like this is the same character. And Vincent D'Onofrio is like kind of playing him similarly, but it, a lot of my friends just wish they had recast Kingpin. Oh, wow, really? Yeah. Uh, see, I, I like D'Onofrio, but... Oh, oh, no, and my friends like D'Onofrio too. They just feel okay. like they, they can't reconcile the Netflix version with this version. No, I, I, I will agree with that. Like, I, and not just, like, obviously, this is, like, a PG version of the MCU, right? And, like, or, or PG-13, maybe. And the the Netflix shows, I wouldn't say they were rated R, but they were definitely a very hard PG-13. And, like, you're never going to see somebody get decapitated with a car door into Disney+. Plus. Um, but not just his, like, his behavior seems toned down, like, it's weird to say that there's a version of the Kingpin who seems family friendly, but this one is. Um, and, but like one, we don't hardly get enough of him. Like he's in about yeah. 20 minutes of screen time. And two, also like I was confused because did you uh, did you ever finish watching the Netflix, the Marvel Netflix stuff? No, I, okay. I, I watched two seasons of Daredevil, two seasons of Jessica Jones, 
Um, and I was like halfway through the second season of Luke Cage when I had started up working a job where I had to get up early and those episodes were all like over an hour long and I mm-hmm. would have tried to watch it after I got off work and I hadn't yet adjusted to the new sleep schedule. So I just kept falling asleep during one of those episodes and then eventually enough time passed where I just kind of dropped off. So I never watched this, uh, the third season of Jessica Jones. I never watched the third season of Daredevil. I never watched the second season of Iron Fist and I didn't watch the second season of Punisher. So those were what I missed. Okay. Um, if you're, uh, I would say, um, the second season of Iron Fist is definitely much, much better than the first season. It's also only 10 episodes long instead of 13. Um, if that's a thing, you know, like, cause I think uh, everyone's joint complaints was, Hey, these seasons are way too long. Like there's not enough plot to justify 13 hours. Um, but like, uh, I, I liked Punisher season two, but I didn't like it as much as Punisher season one. Um, what else did you say? Did you watch Luke Cage season two? Um, no, that was the one where I like oh, was halfway through it and I couldn't okay. stay away. I I didn't like Luke Cage season two as much as season one. I I know we're we're supposed to be talking about Hawkeye. I'm just oh, trying to give you like a if you oh, ever uh, wanted to I think it's all on Disney Plus now, isn't it? It is, yeah. Okay. Well, no, so, I'm glad you're giving me this rundown. Um because how how about the third seasons of Daredevil and Jessica Jones? Because that second season like, okay, let me put my cards on the table. I think the first season of Jessica Jones, if we're counting the Netflix shows as MCU the first season of Jessica Jones is the best thing the MCU ever produced. I love that. And the second season broke my heart. I thought it was really bad. <laughs> um, not Falcon and the Winter Soldier bad, but pretty dang bad. Um, so how's the third season of that? Um, I, I'll be honest, like there was somewhat recently I was trying to remember like what happened in Jessica Jones season three. Um, I remember some stuff, but like the, there's some stuff in it where it's just, I probably completely forgot a lot of what happened in Jessica Jones season three. Um, it I actually didn't hate uh, when I first saw spoilers for Jessica Jones. It's a big spoiler. When I saw that Jessica's mom was still alive, I was like, oh, heck no. Um, but then I actually kind of liked it and I liked what they did with the mom. And I hope I'm not like, you know, friendship over, like, how dare you? But I, I kind of liked what they did with the mom in season two. Uh, so I didn't hate season two as much as some people did. Um, and also like, while I think Jessica Jones season one was very well done, it was also very hard for me to watch. Like that's some of the heaviest television I've ever seen. And it it's something I don't think I will ever go back and rewatch it just because it's really heavy. Like the subject matter is just really difficult to get through. Um, even if you, you know, whether you've been through that kind of stuff or not, but it was just something that I was like, ah, this is hard to do. Um, so, but yeah, Jessica Jones, if you, you might, I'm not sure, because there's like a big plot point in season three, and I don't know how you would feel about it. But, um, uh, and then Daredevil season three, I think it's better than Daredevil season two. Uh, season two of Daredevil felt kind of clunky because they were having to set up, they, they were still doing stuff with the hand, and they were having to set all that up. Uh, but also they were, like, I think the Punisher stuff is the better part of that season, uh, but they were also like at the end of that season, they were trying to set up Punisher in his own show. And I think season two of Daredevil is like the weaker season of that series. I, I think season three is really good. Um, okay. Well, that's, that's generally what I hear. I just hear nobody um, talk about that third season of Jessica Jones. It seemed it was the last Marvel Netflix show season mm-hmm. and it just sort of seemed to unceremoniously drop and no one talked about it. Yeah. Um, it's I, I'll. Like I said, like, I don't remember hating it, but I also don't remember much about it. Um, Like, I know there was more going on in that than what I can remember in my brain. Um, But can I say a slight spoiler for Daredevil season three that regards the Kingpin? Go for it. Uh, So in season one, finally, like the king, you spend so much of season one being like, this guy is invincible. We're not going to be able to take him down. Like he has people, he has the police in his pocket. He has like people in the media in his pocket. Like he was effectively invincible Like uh, and uh, also invisible. Like he, for a while, no one even knew he existed. Uh, and then it, one of the most satisfying victories I've ever seen in entertainment where Daredevil and his friends are able to take him out. Uh, and then he, season three, he is slowly solidifying his uh, base of power. Um, and then, uh, I mean, th- this is not too much of a spoiler. Daredevil defeats him again. Uh, and so now, once again, we see that Kingpin is back and he's like, once again, got his base of power. And I'm a little confused. Like, okay, how? How did this, like, 
Mm-hmm. Now, like ev- everyone, he has been defeated twice. And like everyone in New York knows who this guy is. And I was a little confused why Kate was asking, who is this? Because I was thinking if she's 22 now and then Infinity War was five years ago, uh, then and like we don't know when the, nar- the the Netflix stuff takes place. But sometime after, like, I think she would be just old enough. She would have remembered this guy being in the news, I would think. Like if mm-hmm. she was like if she was 12 when uh well, yeah, yeah. If she was 12 in the alien invasion in the first Avengers movie, then she would have been like maybe 13 or 14 when the Kingpin uh, got taken out like the second time. And I, so I was other than like telling people who have never watched the, the Netflix stuff who this guy is. I was a little I was like, wait a minute. Why is she asking who that guy is? She's been in New York her whole life. But um, but yeah, like to your point that was forever ago about how your friends said they can't reconcile this with the Netflix shows. I'm kind of that way, too, as far as like somehow Kingpin is once again back in charge of the criminal underworld of New York after he's been removed from his base of power twice in the Marvel Netflix shows. And I'm confused how he was able to do that yet again and how he's seemingly like he's not in prison after all the stuff he did in the Marvel Netflix shows. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. I think thank you for that, because uh I, I never saw Daredevil season three, um, and I don't really remember a whole lot of what happened with the, that character. But um, yeah, no. So so thank you. Thank you for that. Oh, you're welcome. Um, I I had a few like um, little like y- these are like minor. Uh, you could say these are uh, uh, me just being silly. But I like in the first episode, Hawkeye is watching Rogers the musical. And there's a line in the musical where Steve says, I can do this all day. And my thought was, hang on a second. If Lynn manuel Miranda uh, made a Steve Rogers musical in the MCU, how does he know that Steve said that? Because <laughs> as near as I can remember, Steve said that twice. Once in the 1940s. And again, he said it to himself in Endgame. Um, when, he, you know, when the, the past Steve in 2012 said it to the he time also said traveling it in Steve. Civil War. When he oh, okay, he said that to Tony. Yeah, I don't okay, know. I get okay. the feeling that like there was like a memoir or a documentary or something, and someone who knew him once said he can do with this all day or something. I don't know. Like oh, I, I, oh, I, I believe it. I, I, okay, I, 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 I'll, I, I will allow it, but only if you can say that the guy who was beating him up in the alley, who's like ninety nine years old in this documentary, said like, <laughs> yeah. One time I was fighting him and he said, I can do this all day. And, and they're like, thank you, sir, who, who was bullying like eight pound Steve Rogers in an alley. <laughs> um, but then uh, so that that was something that just kind of like jumped in my mind. But I'll, I'll allow it. My other one was um, when Little Echo was asking Crow Daddy, are, are dragons real? Um, did, uh, I immediately was like, oh, no, they're going to cross over with the Defenders <laughs> because <laughs> the Defenders was for anyone who hasn't seen it the defenders culminates in uh dragon skeletons being buried deep underneath new york city and the hand wants dragon skeletons so they can live longer and when she was asking are dragons real i was like i I was like no 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 and and they do bring in some of the netflix stuff but fortunately as of now knock on wood hopefully they are not going to bring back the hand and dragon skeletons and all that stuff um, Hopefully and also have to commit an act of domestic terrorism to save the day. <laughs> <laughs> um, I also when she's talking to Kazi in the last episode and he says, I can't jump back and forth between both worlds like you. And I was thinking, how does he know she had that conversation with her dad? Um, <laughs> because he, he he wasn't there when when Crow Daddy said uh, you have to jump between two worlds like dragons. And so I was like, wait a minute. Where, how did you find out about that? Um, uh, I yeah, also that I, I think. I think Kazzy, he looks like a cross between, uh, he actually, I thought he looked like a younger version of uh, Jacques, but he also looks a little bit like Jon Snow from Game of Thrones. Oh, no, he um, looks exactly like Jon Snow from Game of Thrones. Yeah. Um, and I was looking at his internet movie database picture, and he looks like 10 years younger in that picture than he does here. Like, just putting a little bit of facial hair on him makes him look so much older. Um but yeah, that I, and it didn't really occur to me. I was like, he looks so familiar. And it was like while we were talking, I was like, oh, he looks kind of like Jon Snow. Um, but yeah, um, that's all I have. Did you have any other points you wanted to hit on? Um, I. Um, well, I, I, I we've been hitting a lot of like the, the, the issues I have and, and you have. And I think we're pretty much in agreement with this. There were just a mm-hmm. few 
things I liked, I really wanted to touch on. Um, the scene where Haley Seinfeld shows up at that uh, safe house, safe apartment that she's stashing Hawkeye in, and she's like, they're like making margaritas, and he's teaching her how to like flick the, the thing. Like, yeah. that was great. I loved that scene. Um, and uh, and it might be like, I don't know, I, I liked a lot of the little moments. I liked the timing and the editing in this, where it, it felt, I don't know, like, it, I think that the show does look very expensive and glossy and, like, high-end network television. And, I don't know, to me, like, the the Matt Fraction Hawkeye comics, the way it's drawn, I feel like if you're going to bring, bring that into live action, you should make it look kind of more like street level like indie movie kind of a look but this is marvel they make stuff that looks glossy and shiny um mm -hmm. and when it's at nighttime the show looks amazing i i think um like the part where they're fighting with all like the the lights around beautiful um but um i i uh i think that the the kind of humor of like Haley Seinfeld falling through the skyline when he's trying to clear her name, the tracksuit mafia for the most part. And like, uh, I don't know, like it, it strikes a perfect balance between Jeremy Renner's kind of like, Hey, uh, whatever. <laughs> like he doesn't really have like a whole, he's not a wacky character the way a lot of these heroes have been. Um, and I don't know. I, I liked how the show felt in tone in line with, the Hawkeye character, and I liked that, and I, I just, I really liked the the partnership, and I liked a lot of the little moments. I like, I think that scene where his hearing aid is busted, and they're sitting in the subway, and he can't really hear what she's saying. Like, that's an amusing scene. I like how it's all done in one take, where they're just sitting there in a flat angle. It almost feels like a Wes Anderson type scene. Or something. <laughs> I like that. Um, yeah, I don't know. It was, okay, it was so a good if show. It, if it oh. was Wes, if it was Wes Anderson's Hawkeye. <laughs> uh, Adrian Brody as Hawkeye and Saoirse Ronan as uh, Kate Bishop, I guess. Yes, yes. Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. Oh, this is good. And uh, uh, til 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 Tilda, Tilda Swinton as uh, Miss Bishop, maybe. And then, and then we have to get Ben Stiller as Jack Duquesne. <laughs> <laughs> I would love that. With a giant yeah. mustache. Hello. <laughs> And he can do the the his the look he did in um Mystery Men and uh no not Mystery Men um Zoolander the Blue Steel look Blue Steel um, yeah, yeah yeah that's good um, um Owen Wilson can be Kazi <laughs> <laughs> hey man what you doing bro I'm just I'm trying to, I'm trying to I'm I also um or he could I, I I want Owen Wilson to be Kingpin where he says the the Bishop woman thinks that she can leave like Goldman and Sachs what are we what are we gonna do about this Kazi <laughs> <laughs> I don't wow. know. That sounded a little. Uh, that, that sounded not like Owen Wilson. I, I sounded failed. just like Owen Wilson. That was good. Uh, um, also, I uh, the part where they where he shoots the Pym arrow at the other arrow. I thought that was. I, I laughed long and hard about that. Um, like I, 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 I that just hit me in the right way. Um, I also the car chase scene. Have you ever seen Children of Men? I am so glad you brought this up. I have a note about that. <laughs> okay. No, but I, I have not seen Children of Men, but I've seen the car chase that this is directly oh, okay. taking it. Yeah, it's and I, I don't, I, there are more, like, it starts off where we're in the car, and it's like the cameraman is right there, and it, like, zo it, it, it cut, you know, it doesn't cut, but it's it's on Kate, and then it goes to Clint, and then it turns around, and we see the car, and it's it's exactly like Children of Men. Yeah, uh, no, children the camera is only ever turning from, like, on a swivel from right to, like, from left to right, mm -hmm. and, like, the... It's an impressive car chase. Yeah. It is just straight up for like five minutes, just children of men. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I really like the car chase, though. And if you're going to steal from something, steal from a good movie. Um, yeah. And, and, uh, but uh, I, um, yeah, I liked I liked the trick arrows. Um, I, I thought that that whole bit, like with the putty arrow and the at one point, I think she shoots uh, not Kazi, but the the other guy who's kind of like the the street leader of the of the tracks. By the way. She, Really, yeah. really good casting on him. He, mm -hmm. his eyes are like just the way David Aja draws eyes in his Hawkeye run. Mm -hmm. Anyways, yeah. Sorry. Um, but I think she shoots him with a USB arrow, and uh, <laughs> the USB arrow is my favorite stupid thing from the the first Avengers movie where uh, he <laughs> is under the control of Loki, and somehow like 
Do you have any idea how difficult it is to put a USB, like to put a flash drive in a USB port, like with your hands? Like, and I'm if I'm sitting right here and I try to do it and it's like, oh, wrong way. I have to turn it around. And somehow, like at an angle, he's able to shoot a USB, like, shoot a flash drive right into a USB port, like from, <laughs> from a distance. Like, I was like, that. that is the dumbest thing I've ever seen in a movie. And I'm so glad that they brought it back. And they were like, yeah, this arrow is pretty much useless unless you're like under the control of Loki and you want to like, get all the shields information somehow <laughs> but um yeah i um i i don't think i have anything else uh well, to say. i i think that um i wanted to give a shout out to the directing duo bert and bertie um mm -hmm. i guess they are writers on uh bob's burgers oh uh, and, and okay. uh they for whatever reason directed episodes of hawkeye i don't know um Despite their names, uh, they they like might suggest that they're they're, uh, they're uh, a, a couple of ladies that mm -hmm. I guess direct live action television and also write for cartoons. Um, I and think I saw I they may have done yeah they did some stuff on the recent HBO show Our Flag Means Death, uh, which I have not seen. But oh, okay. that, yeah, they did that too. I had no idea they worked on Bob's Burgers. I uh, I, I think they have. I okay. you might need to double check, but um, I think like their directing is like the best they, they they direct episodes three four and five and they i think they do the best job um uh because the other guy reese thomas does one two and six and it's pretty good but like um i don't know something about they i feel like the show really finds its identity in episodes three four and five um and uh i also feel like it has the most to work with just as like a show where like the dynamic is kind of like in the full swing but they that car chase like even though it does start off as children of men and like the, the special effects and green screen compositing can get kind of wonky. Um, it's still a really good car chase. And um, mm -hmm. I like them like, like uh, screeching around corners and um, uh, you know, the, the, I like how he's like, I'm not going to smash up a 76 challenger. And then at the end, <laughs> like, challenger got no. smashed up anyways. <laughs> yeah. I like um, that. have um, you read have you read the issue of Hawkeye where he's naked he, he's in bed with a woman and then like yes. you know he's getting, <laughs> and uh, for anyone uh, it's impossible to explain but he's like naked for like an entire issue uh, of this and it's this there's a car chase in the the fraction aha run and, is it aha or aja I I don't know okay um, um but, but he yeah. and Anytime they need to censor his groin, they just put a little picture of like his Silver Age mask, like a face, like a Hawkeye face censoring him. And it's the most hilarious thing you'll ever see in a comic book. And I was really disappointed that this is a Hawkeye who's already like married and a family man and they couldn't do something like that. Like, like <laughs> have naked Jeremy Renner running around and just covering his naughty bits with like a picture of comic book Hawkeye. Uh, I think that'd be funny. Um, that would but, be funny. Um, have you, uh, you have not seen... Um, have you, you, I think you would really like the movie Everything Everywhere All at Once. Uh, oh, okay. It's, it's, I thought it was quite good. Um, but there's a part where a character is not wearing any pants and, <laughs> or any underwear, and they just have it pixelated. <laughs> like the entire movie is in like focus, except for his junk is just pixelated. It's really funny. Um, that, yeah, that sounds like exactly, uh, I've heard a lot of people talk about that movie and I, um, I I guess like I saw that um who's the actress um Michelle Yeoh Michelle Yeoh okay uh I, I saw that she was in like a weird sci-fi like matrixy multiverse movie and I was like oh okay and then I also saw people some like independently saying like there's this movie called everything uh, sorry every which way but loose um and <laughs> and uh no that's a movie with Clint Eastwood and a monkey um but uh I uh Everyone was saying like this is the greatest movie ever, and so I just assumed that that was like a like uh, indie movie about like someone who's like my mom has Alzheimer's and I have to reconcile my difficult relationship that I had, uh -huh. you know, something something like that. And I was like, oh, I don't. And so I, I was like, oh, that's the multi, that's the weird action multiverse movie. Okay, um, I'll probably watch and, it someday. And Michelle Yeoh's husband is played by Short Round from Temple of Doom. Oh, he's not been go. in a movie in over thirty years. Okay, wow. Um, and he's was fantastic. It, was the last one he was in, was it The Goonies or Temple of Doom? Yeah, it was one of those. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, he was just a child okay. actor who was in like three or four movies and then just stopped acting and now he's in this. But he's yeah. amazing. Um, but also, um, what's that? So, okay, this is kind of related to the Marvel Netflix or Marvel Disney Plus shows uh, because that show is directed by a duo called Daniels. 
they're the Daniels, um, mm-hmm. and uh, they almost directed Loki. And yeah. buddy, let me tell you, this this movie really is what if Loki, but good. <laughs> like <laughs> most of it takes place in this innocuous IRS office building. It's a multiversal story where people meet or like have to like encounter and reconcile multiple variant versions of themselves. And it's an action science fiction wacky thing with a lot of exposition kind of thrown in. I I, I legit have to believe that the Daniels walked into like the office at Marvel Studios and they're like, this is the project we want you to direct. They got a whiff of that and went, no thanks. And then said, now let's go make our own version. And let's make it <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I love the idea of, like, one of them is, like, r- feverishly taking notes where they're like, uh, <laughs> nah, no. Like, I'll did you write that down? Um, yeah, I, that sounds like I really need to watch that movie then. Um, well, uh, I've enjoyed this. Um, Connor, we, uh, we had taken a little bit of a break. Uh, do we want to do another podcast soon? Um, there's a, a certain nocturnal rodent uh, who had a movie that's on hbo max do we, is that something are you interested in talking about that i mean yeah if you want to talk about uh the batman with cheese um then we can um uh if you want to talk about spider meme i am always down to talk about that um yeah no i i i'm willing uh yeah no let's do it okay let's do because the batman has got like a limited time on hbo doesn't it no, it's it's on oh. there now, I think. Oh, okay. I wasn't sure if it was going to be like Wonder Woman 1984 where it was on for like a month and then it was off and then it was back on, but... Um, yeah, no, like that was all like day and date. Like the day it's in theaters is the day you can watch it on HBO Max and they do that for a month and then it's off and then it's back on sometime much later. Um, the Batman was in theaters in like early March and I think they had like a thing where they're like after six weeks they'll do, they'll bring it to uh, HBO Max. Gotcha, Okay. Um, well, I, yeah, I'm okay with, uh, we can do the Batman and then we can tackle Spider-Man in the future. Uh, if you're okay with that. Um, I, yeah, yeah. I, um, similar to Hawkeye where I wasn't like, I, I wasn't in a big hurry to watch this show. Uh, I haven't been in a big hurry to watch this Batman movie. I, um, like I used to be a gigantic Batman fan and I, I don't know what it is, but for some reason I just haven't been that excited to watch this, but I'll watch it and maybe hopefully I'll, uh, I'll enjoy it. Yeah, no, I, I hope you do. Um, very quickly, I actually just have like two more notes about Hawkeye to just quickly knock out. Okay. Um, a cop calls Kate and says, "We need to question you," and then he never that comes. Goes back. nowhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's completely dropped. Like to the degree where I wonder why it was even included. Um, yeah. I well, and, and then, I guess like in real life, if your apartment is like torched by Molotov cocktails, the cops are probably going to call you, and they were thinking like, "Well, we need to like address that." But and then like when she's at her. Was it her great aunt's house where they're, you know, when they're yeah. doing the coin thing? She even writes on there, we got to get the cops off my back. And then, like you said, it goes nowhere. Like, they don't they don't ever bring that up again. Uh, you're right. Yeah. The other thing is, I understand episode five is the calm before the storm episode. I get that. Uh, that being said, the scene where Kate and Yelena are talking to each other is one of the longest things <laughs> ever. Now, look, I, I can look at uh, Florence Pugh and... Uh, uh, mm-hmm. It's Haley Steinfeld all day. Mm-hmm. I, uh, <laughs> by the way, I love that in your fixing Black Widow uh, thing, your 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 little suggestion oh. <laughs> about a fantasy they should have included. Um, but um, yeah, so I'm going to give you some timestamps. So, 11 minutes and six seconds into the episode is when Haley Steinfeld walks into her apartment. Okay. And then that's where she meets Yelena, and they get acquainted. And the scene ends 13 minutes. 41 seconds. Okay. Then we cut away to Clint uh, while the Peanuts music plays. And then he uh, he goes and meets up with Grills. And they, they you know, he's like has a place to hang out for a minute. Right. Mm-hmm. That is about uh, all of 39 seconds. Then we cut back to the apartment where Florence Pugh has or uh, Haley Seinfeld has finished eating her uh, her mac and cheese. And then. From 14 minutes and 20 seconds until 21 minutes and 26 seconds, wow. they talk. So that is, for those of you doing the math at home, that is 10 minutes and 20 seconds total with a 39-second intermission 
in the middle there. And that entire uh, scene is two characters with no blocking. They are sitting down and the entire thing is in like close up shot, reverse shot. It's a very boring scene. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. It is probably the most boring scene that can ever feature two of the most beautiful women in the world sitting down talking to each other, but it's okay. It's okay. Especially when all that's really accomplished there is uh, Yelena saying, I'm going to kill Hawkeye and like, hey, are you sure that you should be allied with Hawkeye? Like there's, there's not enough meat to that scene for it to be that long. I didn't realize that was that long. Wow. Yeah, the first time I didn't, I, first time I watched that, I also did not know how, realize how long it was. But then, like, my brother had watched it apart from me, and he said, dude, that scene took forever. Like, really? Oh, okay. And then when I was watching it last night, I was like, wow, this scene is going <laughs> on forever. And, like, I, I had to, like, pause it and, like, jump around and, like, take take a note of how long it was. So Yeah. Um, yeah, when I'm that scene is over, like, you're almost halfway through the episode, and that's with the seven-minute credits. Mm-hmm. And that's especially, like, it's it's even weirder when you consider, like, most of these episodes are, like, around about 30-ish minutes. Like, you've got, like, five to seven minutes of credits, and then there's, like, almost, when you count, like, the little Marvel logo at the beginning and then all the previously on stuff, there's, like, almost, like, two minutes of that. And so these episodes really aren't that long, with the exception of the last one, which is like closer to 50 minutes. But um, and incidentally, I did I just skipped the Rogers the musical uh, that was like 10 minutes of the last episode. I didn't watch any of that. So if anything important happened there, I don't know. Um, but uh, the like so when it's like almost like 30, 35 minutes of episode, and then 10 minutes of that is that conversation. That's pretty crazy. Yeah, like I said, they I understand like it's it's streaming. They don't have ads. They don't. Mm -hmm. They don't really have a time limit. But right. you know, there's going to be those yahoos on the internet that are going to be like, "Damn, we feel ripped off. I only got 20 minutes." Mm -hmm. uh, whatever. Yeah. Anyways, uh, I like this show. It was. It was pretty good. Um, it wasn't Eternals or anything, but it was pretty good. Yeah. Um. All right. Well, in that case, uh, we will be back in the future to talk about the Batman. Um the movie, not the TV series from the early 2000s. Um, and so in the meantime, I am the Comics Kid 2099. And I am Connor Nielsen. And we'll see you guys later. Have a good one.